Yes, so I've just been informed that I'm using the old Zen.org logo, so just... Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. So as many of you know, my name is George Dunlap, and uh, I'm going to be giving a talk on the a technical deep dive of the PVH, um, the new mode, uh, virtualization mode. So um, PVH has been talked about for quite a while, and it's been worked on for quite a while. Um, however, the, the patches haven't been quite the patches haven't been submitted yet, and although people have a kind of a high-level idea about what PVH is supposed to be about, um, I think there's not a widespread idea about exactly the technical details of, of how, it's, how it's implemented. Um, and there's not, a whole, there's not a whole lot of people that have actually done the work of digging into the patches and, and, and understanding them. And um, so my goal for this talk is to give you guys a technical overview of PVH at a fairly relatively detailed level. Um, so that you can, well, for one, even if you're not going to actually do any programming, so that you can understand the characteristics, advantages, and disadvantages of the mode when you decide to use it or not to use it. <coughs> and hopefully, so that many of you can actually approach the code and understand what's going on um, and to help us uh, fix issues with it um, and, and, and improve it. So in order to do that, I'm going to start with um, an overview of uh, PV and HVM and uh, some of their... Um, the things which uh, we wish were better about them, and then uh, talk about PVH. And then I'm going to do a, a fairly technical uh, description of PVH from Zen's perspective, and then PVH from Linux's perspective. Um, and then we're going to talk about some of the outstanding issues in PVH that still need to be sort of uh, sorted out. OK, so <coughs> why PVH in the first place? So issues with PV. The big issue with PV, as we have it right now, is the PV MMU code in Linux. So the um, PV MMU code, uh, most of the PV ops are kind of out of the way, and they're not very expensive. The, the, most of the Zem code in Linux is kind of in its own little area, where the rest of the Linux crowd is happy for it to, to live and, and have its own life and then have to worry about it. But the PV MMU code is right in the guts, in the middle of um, the x86 code. And uh, this has caused a lot of pain for um, the, the, the kernel community as a, as a whole. So it's very easy, it turns out, for people not even touching the Zen code or anything related to Zen to accidentally break um, things that work in Zen or vice versa. And so this causes unhappiness for the Linux, um, for the, uh, Linux maintainers, um, the x86 maintainers. It causes unhappiness for the Zen maintainers. And we would all much be, rather be doing something else. Um, another issue with PV is in 64-bit mode, we have this issue of 64-bit hypercalls are very slow. Um, so the reason for this is that um, in order to uh, do, um, we need to have three levels of protection, at least three levels of protection in order to run a hypervisor. So you need the hypervisor mode, the guest kernel mode, and the um, guest user space mode. And when 32-bit, um, when Zen was being developed for 32-bit operating systems, um, there was uh, a user and supervisor mode, which could easily be used to protect, to separate out the guest user from the guest kernel. But we still needed something to protect the guest uh, from the hypervisor from the guest kernel. And we had this thing um, called a segmentation limit, which basically no one else was using. And so we kind of commandeered that and said, fine, we'll use this to help protect um, the hypervisor from the guest kernel. Now, about the same time that Zen was finding a new use for this uh, basically unused um, uh, processor feature, the AMD folks were coming up with their new 64-bit um, architecture. And I wasn't involved in the discussions, obviously. But w w what I presume happens, they said, well, look, there's this, here's this thing that nobody actually uses. And every additional feature in a processor is expensive to implement. And so they just got rid of it, which means that now for 64-bit, we don't have three levels of protection anymore. And so in order to implement three levels of protection, the guest kernel for 64-bit has to run in user mode. And every time you switch between guest user and guest kernel in 64-bit mode PV, you have to go up into Zen and do at least some level of um, page table uh, flushing and so on. So 64-bit hypercalls are very expensive. So uh, Sorry, could Tim? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, OK. Yes, 64-bit system calls. I'm sorry for that. So it's the 64-bit system calls that are, that are slow, not hyper calls. Thank you. Um, so <clears throat> uh, we could use HVM. HVM basically makes an entire 
clone of the ring zero through three. So now you have, again, four levels of protection for the 64-bit system calls. Um, however, um, it has some things that we're not exactly very happy with. Uh, first of all, you have to have a QEMU process, which is um, an extra level of complication, extra level of more memory that needs to be handled, and, and so on. You have the, a legacy, you're still doing a legacy boot, so you start in 16-bit mode and have to work your way all the way up through to 64-bit mode. Um, and there's a number of devices that have to be emulated inside of Zen, so the virtual, virtual APIC, um, virtual timers, and, and so on. Um, so the idea that was kind of had been kicked around for a long time now is the idea of doing PV in an atrium container. And so the idea here is to take the best aspects of PV and of HBM and make a new mode that takes the best aspects of both of them. And so two years ago, about two years ago, Mukesh Rathor at Oracle began the work of implementing um, PVH. And he started posting patch series to Zendevel, um, I guess, at the beginning of this year, so January. So I was at 10 or 11 months ago now. Um, and it's been gone through a lot of iterations. And the most recent um, set of iterations, um, I have sort of taken them and um, uh, done some significant revisions to them. And so um, what I'm going to be describing today is sort of the state of the art, like what things are like right now. Um, they haven't been checked in yet, and then things are not in their final form. Um, but if I give you the state of the art right now, then you can understand where things are, and you can maybe engage in the discussion and see where things are going. Uh, and I do want to <coughs> emphasize, um, Mukesh did the vast majority of the amount of work for this, and so he gets all the, the credit. Um, one of the main reasons that I did the revision, so one thing was there was a bunch of things that um, the Zen maintainers weren't happy with. And so I thought that I could do a decent job of, of changing some of those things. But one of the big things was I wanted to be able to, I didn't actually have a very deep understanding of the PVH mode and the interface between Linux and Zen. And I wanted to get um, a better understanding of that. And I thought that forcing myself to rewrite the passages and also forcing myself to give this talk would enable me to get a much better understanding of that. And so um, I'm happy that people in the audience will be able to correct me if I make mistakes, but I, hopefully the fact that I'm not a super expert in it, but I have learned quite a bit, mean, will mean that I can make it accessible to other people who are not also experts in it. Right, so PVH from Zen's perspective. So at a very high level, you begin with the atrium guest, you disable atrium specific things that you don't need, you start it in 64-bit mode and you keep it there, and um, then you enable a PP path for a handful of things. So that's a kind of a super high level. Going into more detail. So things that get disabled from Zen's perspective. Uh, so you disable the device model, QMU, um, and that means disabling all of the um, MMIO instruction, uh, MMIO emulation. Uh, disabling emulated hardware. So Zen emulates a number of things that are required for um, performance reasons, APIX and PIT stuff. So you disable the, that for PVH guests. Um, you disable nested HVM and MSIX, uh, I think that's, yes, okay. Then, so to pit it in 64-bit mode, um, you set initial values for the CR0, CR4, and EFER to make it 64-bit page mode. Um, and then, it turns out there, there are a handful of things that, need, that happen in um, HVM mode when you transition from non-page mode into paging mode. And so uh, for PVH guests, you need to make it a special call to have this thing happen when the vCPU first boots up, because it's never going to, to switch from non-page into paging mode since it starts in paging mode. Um, and then you basically just disable the guest from changing the paging mode. So you disable writes to the EFER, and you don't allow the guest to change the paging-related bits in Sierra Zero. As far as PV paths, you um, enable a set of PV hypercalls. Um, and if you're really interested, I have a slide later that has the exact hypercalls in it. Um, you need a PVA20 map because you're not starting with a BIOS. Then you need a, a PV way of getting the, the memory map. Um, the PVH has a, a special way of doing vCPU booting. Um, and I'm going to cover that in the, on the Linux side of things. And we have a PV CPU ID. There's a number of special cases for CPU ID that have to do um, DOM0. So if you look in the code, there's a whole bunch of extra things that they have to do for DOM0. Um, so we just take the PV path for that and give you um, that answer. And um, we take the PV path at the moment, we take the PV path for programmed I.O. Um, and we're going to talk about this a little bit later in the issues section. <clears throat> so from Linux's perspective, sitting inside of Linux, um, uh, some sim simple things like PVH, Zen H HVM domain is false, Zen PV domain is true. 
But the most, the biggest thing is you just have Linux act natural. So there's a huge number of special cases for PV that now you don't have to do anymore. Um, there are, one of the interesting things is there, um, the fact that we're doing what's called auto translation, which means the guest is in charge of its own page tables, has a number of interesting side effects that are important to understand. So I'm going to go into that. Um, and then, uh, so we use the PVHVM callback vector setup, um, and there's a PVH, a specific PVH uh, VCP you bring up, which I'll describe. All right, so things disabled. This is kind of a nice list to have. So there's no PV IDT. There's no PV IRQ ops. So this was, this was special callbacks that happened after the IRQ. There's no PV CPU ID. Um, we have a native syscall and sysenter. Um, no PV VM assists. There's no event safe callbacks. Um, there's no need to set the IO privilege level when doing certain kinds of IO. And in particular for MMU ops, there's no need to pin in the page tables. There's no need to do a PFN to MFN conversion. There's no need to special case the page table protections. And there's only one PVU, PMMU op, which we need to actually have a special case for them. And that is TLB flush others. And presumably that's because it's cheaper and easier to simply ask Zen to flush the other guy's TLB than to go through the whole work of like um, uh, sending IPIs and stuff like that yourself. So this is much, much cleaner um, and should hopefully uh, result in a much better interface with, with Linux. <coughs> um, Auto-translate. So in the PV case, page tables are controlled by Zen. And we have the real MFN inside the page tables. And so you get things like um, when uh, a PV guest talks to Zen, it can, it can say, here's a grant table or here's an MFN. Please map it here. And then it doesn't, have to wor it doesn't actually have to worry about um, the guest PFN. The, the MFN can be used just the way that it is. Um, <clears throat> in the PVH case, the page tables are controlled by the guest. And what it writes in the guest page tables is what's called a GPFN. So it's the guest idea of the, of the PFN, not the actual backing MFN. Um, and so every page that is, is mapped in an auto-translate guest, like PVH, must be in the P2M. Um, so this is uh, one of the key differences between PV and PVH. Um, it has a lot of uh, number of side effects. So any kind of a special page, for instance, the grant frame, you have to make, sort of make a hole in the P2M and then like map it in there. Um, anytime you map a foreign page, like if you are running QME or something else like that in DOM0, for instance, you need to, um, rather than uh, having the hypercall that says map this MFN in this page, you have a hypercall that says map this MFN in this P2M entry. And then you can uh, map it yourself by writing in the page tables. Um, and a number of similar things like that. Um, OK, so the PV VCP bring up. So the PV is brought up via hypercalls. Uh, sorry, the, the VCPs are brought up via hypercalls, just like they are in the PV case. Um, presumably because in the HVM case, you have um, a local APIC and things like that that you can use to send the, the bring up messages. <coughs> However, because the guest controls the IDT, um, a lot of the PV code for loading up the processor uh, can't actually be guaranteed to, to work properly. So what we do instead um, is we only set a handful of registers. In this case, you set the, the, the GS by default. Um, so in, in, the, in the PV case, typically you would set almost all of the context for the vCPU before bringing it up. Um, in the PVH case, um, you only set this one bit, uh, the, the guest GS and, and a couple of other things, CS and, and EIP. And then the other state has to be set um, by the CPU that's, as, as it's booting. So minor difference there. OK, a couple of things in PVH that are not yet working at this point. So 32-bit, which hasn't been implemented yet. Um, virtual TSC, so the only TSC mode that is supported is um, reading the, the hardware thing directly from the CPU. Um, shadow mode is not yet implemented. Um, so uh, this is not a guest visible thing. Um, but I think if we should have some time, I can talk a bit later about the HA, um, HAP versus shadow. And um, the vCPU hot plug from the Linux side is not yet implemented. Um, and there's, I'm, I'm sure there's a larger number of uh, fixed means in the code that haven't been fixed either. All right, so a couple issues. Um, so one is, the, so the original idea of PVH was to have a lightweight container 
that would be, um, rather than having a full heavyweight sort of HVM with all the different stuff in it, that you would just like kind of get rid of most of that stuff and say, we'll just have this nice lightweight little container that will just do a few things, okay, and should that, that should be faster. However, <coughs> the reality was, in order just to get the minimum functionality of HVM requires most of the code that's already in, already in the HVM path. Does that make sense? So we started by saying, um, so Mukesh started by saying, instead of using the existing HVM code, we'll make an entirely new thing, a, a different path that we use for PPH. But as it turned out, the, the two paths were, you know, I don't know exact, exact number, but say 70% the same. The result is there's a very large amount of code duplication. Um, and this is really bad from a, from a lot of perspectives. It's hard to see exactly what's going on. It's also hard to uh, maintain and, and as bug things going forward and, and, and everything. So <clears throat> the current patch that I've done, um, we use the HVM path uh, for the HVM container, and we just put in a couple of special cases for PVH. And the result, one of the results of that is that the patch itself is a lot smaller because only a handful of things that you need to change. Um, <clears throat> another issue that we're sort of in the process of dealing with right now is um, PIO instructions. Um, so there's a number of things that uh, the PV path will give you. Um, so uh, it allows the guest to do direct access to PIO instructions. Um, there's apparently a thing called a PV pit. Like I didn't, I, I never heard of this before, but if you look in the deep code, there's a couple of special cases where you say, okay, here's a pit. Um, all right. Um, but some guests may want to use that. So, um, and there's a couple other things like, um, a couple of tricks that you have to do to be able to access the PCI config space. But one of the doozies is that um, old, many platforms uh, will use special I.O. instructions, not as a normal programmed I.O., which is just a kind of a reader or a write, but which effectively acts as a function call into the platform stuff. So if you know SM, SMM is a system management mode, which is um, kind of a thing that a lot of uh, people who write uh, platforms, um, motherboard, um, manufacturers and things like that, right to kind of be able to get in little hooks and things under the operating system. And so in order to, uh, what we have to do to make that work is to actually execute the exact same instruction in Zen using the guest um, general purpose reg register. So there's a whole thing where we, on the stack, make a little tiny function, we load up uh, the guest registers, execute the one instruction, the IM instruction, which will then trap into SMM. SMM will do whatever magic is going to do and change the guest general instructions. And then when we finish, they will return back into normal mode. And then we take all the general instructions and load them again into the guest context and come back into Zen. And then finish the thing that we're doing and then return into the guest, which will then, of course, take the general inst instruction registers and put them back into the... Um, it's the What's that? Can we the from orbit? Um, uh, <laughs> Can we nuke the BIOS authors from Orbit instead? Um, unfortunately, that's not. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so anyway, um, th so there's a lot of, so right now, um, there's a lot of special cases in the, the PV path that we have to have if you're going to run DOM0 as a PVH, which is one of the main purposes that, uh, for which Oracle started the PVH work. <clears throat> However, there's some problem with this, with this method. So right now, we just, from the HVM thing, we call the PV um, IO path. So one problem is, in order to allow the PV code to properly emulate things for PVH guests. There's a number of ugly changes that we had to do. Okay, so probably three or so of the uh, of the patch series were some fairly ugly changes um, that had to do with making this possible. Most of the other changes are very straightforward, just okay, simple switches. But these are not very nice. Moreover, there's apparently um, a race condition because. Uh, of, of, of sort of a double checking. I, I won't go into the thing, but there's, there's checks that happen in the hardware um, that before you even get into Zen, and then after that, there's, a, there's other checks that um, Zen is doing. And the fact that there's a race between these two sets of checks um, is a potential security issue. So <clears throat> uh, we've just been literally just talking about this um, earlier this week. Um, so th the basic, the reason that a lot of this stuff happens in Zen in the first place is that we need two sets of access controls, one for user processes and one for the guest, right? So the, the guest operating system needs to say, this, this process is allowed to do these things. And then Zen has to be able to say, this guest is only allowed to do these certain things, right? Um, so in the PV case, we only have one set of kind of permissions to, to, to 
hardware things to, to do that with. And so therefore, we need to um, we use the hardware things to uh, enforce the guest permissions, and we use the and then in, we emulate stuff in Zen to enforce the the sorry. We use the hardware things to guess the user space permissions, and we, we use emulation in Zen to enforce the guest permissions. But um, so PV only has one, but PVH we actually have two potential sets of the permissions because the guest has its own um, HVM stuff, and then the VMX code itself has another thing that we can we can control for uh, the guest operating system. So it's possible that we may not need to um, do all this kind of crazy I/O emulation anymore, and those crazy um, I/O instructions which need to execute on the stack and that kind of stuff um, may be able to be executed in the PVH context, and that would also be a big win for Zen as a whole, if um, because then we could. Um, get rid of some of these crazy paths. Um, but that's just an idea at this point. We'll have to see if that actually works or not. OK. Um, so I have a little bit of time here. One thing I, I want to bring up, um, just this is sort of more informational than about PVH. It's about HAP versus Shadow. Um, so uh, <coughs> there's a couple key differences between HAP versus Shadow. HAP is hardware-assisted paging, um, also known as EPT in the Intel world, or SVM, I think it was called in the, um, the AMD world. And the basic idea um, is that you allow the hardware to do a lot of the translation instead of having to do the having Zen. So if you're going to do a page table update in HAP, it's really, really cheap. It's just a memory write. It's exactly the same as a page table, cost of a page table update in um, uh, bare metal mode. In shadow, ultimately, because we're, we're keeping, they have, there's the guest page tables and we have a shadow copy of the um, page tables inside of Zen, um, ultimately, every time something is updated in the shadow page tables, it has to, Zen has to be involved in updating that. And it, everything up, every time something is updated in the guest page tables, Zen has to be involved in updating that in the um, hypervisor page tables before it can actually be used. Now, we have done, before HAP came out, we did a lot of work in optimizing this path. But ultimately, Zen has to be involved in every single translation if, before it's used. So this means page table updates for Shadow are very, very slow. Um, TLB effectiveness, so HAP is using the same hardware. Um, and so uh, TL TLBs in x86 only have um, 16 entries. However, you can have, um, each entry can point to a 4K page, or a 2 megabyte page, or a 1 gigabyte page. And so HAP allows you to use the um, increase use the super pages to allow you to have a more effective use of the TLB. This is, I think, another one of the reasons that Oracle is particularly interested in HAP mode. Uh, it's right in PVH mode um, is to be able to uh, use the super pages for databases where this is pretty important. <clears throat> um, and in Shadow, you can allow guest super pages in the guest page tables. But when those map into the shadow page tables, there's still only 4K pages at the moment. And so a shadow will, not, will uh, not allow you to have the higher TLB effectiveness that HAP will have. Okay? So again, here's another place where HAP is definite win. However, when it comes to TLB replacement costs, if there's a TLB miss, now think that things are turned around. Because in shadow, the worst case, if you have a 64-bit guess, is that you may have to do four memory reads. Okay? So, um, um, level one, two, three, and four um, may require you to, to read the memory, okay? HAP, your best case, if your, um, if your guest is using super pages and your, um, your P to M is able to have super pages, um, then you will have nine memory reads. And in the worst case, if your guest has, um, is using 4K pages and you don't have super pages in your P to M, then you'll have 16 memory reads. Um, huh? 25, actually. 25, okay. Oh, right, right, right. Okay, so my numbers here are wrong. So, so the, the best case is three, so that, that should be three times four then? 12 and 25? Um, anyway, it's a lot more than four. <laughs> 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 it's even worse than I thought, okay. So, um, and does this matter? And I haven't done any um, uh, performance tests recently, but it used to be the case that kernel build, Shadow would be 30% slower than HAP, right? Because kernel build has very, very good TLB locality, and it has a huge number of um, page table updates, right? However, for other things like SpecJBB, SpecJBB 
it sets up the page tables once and then never touches them again. So the HA, so there's basically zero cost for Shadow for page table updates. However, it has very, very poor TLB locality. Um, and so the result is that typically, I mean, in the past, we've done this kind of measurement, Shadow is about 30% faster than HAP. Um, so all this to say that um, Shadow isn't dead. It will still be important in the future. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that was the main thing. So moving to PVH, this is one of the effects, is that now um, we'll have, have to deal with this uh, HAP shadow thing, and that's going to be um, something we're going to have to continue to look at in the future. Okay, that's all I have. Um, all right, so we talked about PV and uh, HVM and PVH. Um, we looked at PVH from Zen's perspective, from Linux's perspective. We talked about a number of issues in PVH, and hopefully now I've given you a technical overview, and you will be able to better understand the characteristics, advantages, and disadvantages. And hopefully many of you will be able to approach the code to improve it and to fix it, if necessary. With that, I'll take any questions. Fast. So, uh, oh, so a uh, comment and a question. So sure. uh, with the hardware accelerated pages, if you're using large pages, then the yeah. 25 axis go away and the spec JV slowdown goes away. Um, so have you tested that? Absolutely. OK. Um, so I'd suggest maybe uh, doing another test. look at uh, doing PBH only with large pages or something like that. Yeah. So in general, um, there's Zen be, there's tries. No case where shadow is faster than hardware paging if you're doing it right, basically. OK. Um, the second so so you're, you're talking primarily about in the guest, um, so in, in, in Zen, making sure that you have using super pages in the P2M. Yes. So Zen tries very hard always to try and to, to do that. Right. So. Uh, the second question I had was about um, not emulating an APIC. So right. So with the hardware uh, APIC virtualization that's coming in the Haswell processors, mm -hmm. any concern that not being able to do post-it interrupts would actually make PBH slower than HVM in the long run? And have you considered doing APIC emulation so that you can take advantage of future hardware support? Um, I haven't looked at it at all. Does anyone else want to comment on that? Uh, Jan raises his hand. <laughs> yeah, I think that is certainly a possibility, but um, at the moment there is no reason to uh, alter further of the PV paths in the, uh, in the Linux kernel in order to get the thing to work at least. So I think this can easily be a gradual approach. Okay. Yes. So, I, so uh, you were mentioning about the boot case where I, I was not completely clear. So when you're booting a Linux kernel in the PVH case, <coughs> you're going to jump directly into the kernel at a spot where paging has already been turned on? So th that's what happens in PV mode right now. Okay. So, so in PV mode, um, you construct the, 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 you have the domain builder that will, inside the guest user space, construct the PV uh, kernel in, in an RD, and then jump right to it. And it's already set up, and the paging modes are already set up. But you cannot do that with the PVH case? Um, yes, yes, you do oh, that with you PVH do the case. Same thing. Yes. Oh, OK. Yeah, so I was discussing um, the implementation of that with HVM. Because in HVM mode, so I'm, I was talking about changes from HVM into PVH. So HVM, you start in. Uh, yeah, yeah. You start in real mode, and then you go to 16, 32, da, 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 da. OK. More questions? My god, you make me wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I would suggest the next question come from the guy over there. Like, so. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, uh, it makes sense to say, for example, all that you described, that uh, we don't have to start in real mode, and there things can be done in an easier way. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, on the guest side, all that code already exists anyway. So it's already there, it's already implemented, there is, you're not going to have to implement it again. So the real reason to have something like this would be performance. And so how mm -hmm. much performance gain do you get on top of PV on HVM? Right. Um, so it's another thing I haven't, um, I haven't had time to actually test that yet. And, sorry. <laughs> Ah, <laughs> so I did run it <laughs> wrongly. <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, I, I wasn't positive until you actually were there. <laughs> More questions? Actually, 
Yes. Which has all the you know bad and bad system calls, and then if you do PD or if you do PDA, you you lose the system call overhead. I mean, that is yeah, so, so, so the main reason, so one of the big things that Oracle wanted from this um, and that the, their target is, is, it to, is for a PVH DOM zero. Um, and so basically, uh, um, you can't run a normal PVH VM thing in DOM zero. You could try to do what, so there was a talk earlier today about um, running a pure HVM DOM zero. Um, and uh, we don't know the technical details of how much, how much harder that is or how much uglier that may be than just running a PVH. Um, but definitely PVH is better than, uh, for PVH for DOM0 um, is the only alternative to PV DOM0. And PVH will certainly be better in many cases than PV DOM0 because of the system, uh, for 64-bit system call um, overhead, yes. Okay, we've run a bit over time. I can still take one question. No? Thank you. Okay, thank you.